Up next, we have Art Wagner, who works for USDA APHIS PPQ, and he'll tell us about one of our ongoing partnerships um, between WIFDEN and USDA, and that is the Cerceris WASP survey program in Wisconsin. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Art Wagner. I'm a pest survey specialist, uh, which is a fancy way to say survey biologist for the USDA Plant Protection Quarantine Program here in Madison. Uh, though I do work across the state. Uh, and this is kind of an unusual situation for us. Having a partnership with members of the public to help us do our survey activities is not something we typically do, but uh, we've been at it now for several years, and I think it's trimmed out really well. So um, I'll share a little bit about it. Okay, so um, the problem is that there are these wood boring beetles called the Prestids that uh, exist around the world and are adapted to whatever their local environment is. Uh, however, like other invasive species, when they get transmitted from one part of the world to another, they can cause major problems. Uh, in this case, um, the, uh, there are several that uh, we're particularly interested in as a regulatory agency, and that is Emerald Ash Borer, which I hope most of you have heard about um, because it's in Wisconsin. But there are several other species that we're interested in that are not uh, gold spotted oak borer, oak splendor beetle, European oak borer. Now, those are just the ones we know about. Uh, there are a lot of these insects that we don't know about yet because they're not an issue. They haven't been discovered. They're not a problem in their native land. But they could just as easily be brought over into the U.S. on wood products like pallets and crates, things of that sort. Um, what happens is these insects, as larvae, are inside these wood products. Thus, they escape detection. And if the wood products are not properly, properly treated before they are used in shipping, you end up having them move into the U.S. and, and maybe establishing new invasive populations. Um, so we have this neat mechanism, this neat biological mechanism for survey. It's called Cerceris, Cerceris filmopenis. It's a native wasp, about medium-sized. Um, they're a ground-nesting wasp that's native, and they do not nest in like a typical wasp nest you might see in your house. Instead, they build solitary nests in disturbed sandy soil. And here you can see an example of that. It looks like a little volcano. The hole there is about the size of a pen, a little bit bigger than a standard number two pencil. Um, now, however they can, even though they don't build communal nests, they do live in these aggregates or loose communities, and you can have several hundred nests in a single area. The neat thing about them, there's actually there's a whole bunch of neat things about them. Uh, first of which is they like to build their nests in disturbed sandy soil, and a perfect place to find them is a baseball field, especially one that's not been perfectly maintained. Um, the females, here she comes, provisions the, her nests with bucrested beetles. Um, and there she goes. Um, and there she comes back again. The... Uh, um, and they use agrilus species and other buprestids, and these just happen to be the beetles that we're really interested in and concerned about. So the fact that we have a native wasp that goes out into the forest and can find these beetles that are really hard to trap using any other method. Um, we don't have good pheromones. Well, we don't have any pheromones. And we don't have good lures. So finding them for us to this point has been a shot in the dark. But they're really important insects can cause a lot of damage. Um, so they go out, they find these beetles, they paralyze them with their stinger, and they bring them back to their nests. All right, let's see if she stays gone. There we go. So, uh, so what we do is we go out to these baseball fields, and we walk, we identify baseball fields, and I'll show you this later. And we, uh, we go out to the fields and walk and look for nests, and we look for flying wasps. And we can collect these beetles from the wasps in one of two day ways. We don't disturb the nests at all. Um, we certainly don't want to harm the population, but we can either pick up drops, which are uh, beetles that occasionally get dropped by the females when they're flying in, off the ground, or we can actually net the females, because the one of the other neat things about these is they don't sting for defense. 
And it turns out there are actually a bunch of wasp species that have this same kind of biology, where they have a, a, um, a paralytic poison rather than a, a pain-causing poison. So stinging for defense is just something they don't do. If they're scared, they hide. Um, and as you can see, that's that's my arm sticking in there, and I'm handling a wasp and, and having no problems. So here's just another slide to show you what the nest looks like underneath the ground. Um, there's, they build these little nests, look like tiny volcanoes as they push up the soil. And down in the tunnel, there will be multiple chambers. And in each chamber, they will bring in a single blueprested and lay an egg right on its chest, on its thorax. So you can see that from that little picture there. When you're looking at it in the field, the nests often look on the right. You can see, and this wasn't a setup picture. This is one I took when I was out. There's a group of nests and a couple of shiny metallic beetles with that kind of, that teardrop shape is very bepressed like. So, so that's what you're going to see in the field. And in this case, we just pick up the beetles, throw them in a bag, and, and call it good. In general, how the survey works is um, by, uh, I would identify fields near your area uh, using Google Maps or a program like Google Maps. Google Earth is what I usually use. Um, and I would send you out the locations, basically an aerial photograph saying here's where the, the fields are. You go to the field and take a quick walk around the perimeter out by where the grass is and then once around the baseline and then once out to the mound. So walking a field typically for the first time takes about 10 minutes. And you just identify if you see any nests that look like sorceress. Um, you count them. And if you see any beetles, you pick them up. And then at the end of the year, you send in the beetles and we send them off to a uh, expert identifier at Purdue University who does all our IDs for us, and that's how we get our data. Um, this is just to give you an idea of what's gone on in the past. Um, I started the survey on my own, and I, could, I just couldn't get out to the sites um, enough to make a difference. However, we started using volunteers. Uh, we were lucky enough to be one of the, the flagship Wiften programs. And in, 2014, we had 18 volunteers who visited 164 sites, collected almost as many beetles, and uh, the participation rate is just a reflection of how many people said they were going to do it and then followed through and actually did it. Uh, 2015, we had 12 volunteers. Um, they went to 85 sites, um, but still, but the beetle collection went up considerably. It went up to 240, and our participation rate was still good. Um, I know these are really simple maps, but they're just to kind of show you the breadth of where we've been visiting. Um, at this point, the color is immaterial on those pinpoints. Um, so in 2015, I just want to show you a little bit of what we did. So once again, we had 12 volunteers, 241 beetles collected. 223 of those were identified to species. So we know exactly what almost all of those, those insects were. 42 different taxa, that means 42 different species of beetles, and 90 of those beetles was were agrylus of uh, genera, and agrylus, of course, is the genera from our lab for, as well as several of the other insects that we're looking for. And we did collect 35 from our lash borer, um, though we didn't collect any from a county that we didn't already have under quarantine. And I don't expect you to memorize this, but just, just to go is to show you that your data is actually getting used. The people who volunteered and put in all the time to collect these insects, we follow through. We, we get these identifications, and we share them with um, other agencies, the State Department of Ag, the university. Um, you know, I share it with my counterparts in Illinois and Minnesota. So if you're going to be working, we're, we're going to do the best we can with the data you provide us. And I, I just wanted to show you, these are some photographs. I'm putting these sheets together for this year. I haven't done it before. Um, they're just a little pictorial example of what we have found in the past. I do not expect anybody to identify these insects. Uh, I can't. There's a reason we send them off to an expert in, at Purdue University. Um, but Prestitutes are really tough to uh, identify. So, um, But this way, 
people who collect some, if they're curious, they can dig through these pages and say, oh, it looks like that, maybe. Or it doesn't look like anything, and maybe I found something cool. But we won't do anything about it until we hear back from the identifier. Uh, that was 2016, so this is last year. Um, these are just the sites where we either had insects or we made collections. We certainly did not get to the entire state. So this is just a representative of where we were and what we found there. Now you'll notice our volunteers are way down this last year. Um, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Primarily because the insects are not always in all the ball fields, so we do get a certain amount of people each year, a volunteer, who just don't have anything near them that produces samples. So, of course, they tend to find other things to do. Um, the other thing is for the last two years, our office has been at half staff, and I have been doing everything except really being involved in the survey. Um, that's changing this year. I go back to being a pest survey specialist and not two or three other jobs, as well as being a pest survey specialist. So um, I think being involved, I'm able to communicate with everybody. I put out a weekly newsletter. You know, I, I do things to keep people connected and interested. Um, so hopefully we'll see an uptick this year. Um, so last year, even though there were only five people, we still got the 82 fields, which isn't much worse than the year before. And 220 beetles, it's effectively no drop off. So what we're having is fewer volunteers and fewer fields visited because each of those volunteers covers a, a limited area. But we're not getting any meaningful drop in, sorry, I didn't want to go there yet. Uh, no drop in collection. So what we're doing now is we're having the volunteers that are left that are sticking with us have really good fields. And uh, that's ideal, but we have so much of the state to cover that we haven't gotten to yet that we really need new volunteers, new people to help us out to check out sites that we haven't seen before. <laughs> Okay, uh, if you want to get involved, and I'll make this short, um, I talked about scouting, which is uh, just going and walking the fields at the beginning of the year, which starts around July 4th. You know, obviously, I don't expect anybody to be out on the holiday. Um, if you don't have a lot of time, but you want to be involved, and you're in an area where we haven't checked the fields before, this is a great way to do it, because you just go out, you walk the fields, you, send a, you can send an email back to me about what you found at each site, whether you found any nests, or you found any beetles, and you're done. And then now I can put those fields onto my map, and I can start looking at trying to figure out if I can get somebody out there on a regular basis. Um, if you want to stay with us through the season, once you get out and you've scouted and you, you say, okay, right, there's some nests here, you can do a delimit, which is then a, a very... It, and you can do it however you want. I just happen to go back and forth like the red line shows here. Counting every nest to make sure that we have a good, accurate uh, estimate of, of how many of the wasps have nests at the site. Um, and then you can collect any beetles you find in Ziploc bags. And I provide little sample tags for you. It's just a little slip of paper. Uh, and then you become a full-blown part of the survey, um, which is fantastic. Um, and then monitoring, I say weekly here. It doesn't have to be weekly. Um, you know, the, I, I don't think it necessarily needs to be monitored more often than weekly. I think if you get more than once or twice a week, you start to find issues with, um, you know, it does take a while for these drops to accumulate because they don't happen all the time. So if you go once a week or once every two weeks, it's kind of ideal because you'll be able to find the insects and th they'll be hopefully something there every time you go, which, of course, makes it much more interesting. Uh, so why go through all this? Um, as a regulatory agency, you know, I'm not a researcher per se. We're, we're actually trying to come up with, with solutions to these issues. And as with all invasive species, the earlier you can detect it moving into an area, the more options you have for stopping it or controlling it. So you guys, if you participate in the survey, will really be on the front lines of invasive species detection. And if you find something new, you'll have directly contributed to what will, might become a major effort to try to stop the establishment of a new species. The other thing this does for us is we're able to monitor the spread of existing invasives that we know about, like emerald ash borer. So in Wisconsin, a lot of the counties still are not quarantined for EAB. Don't, don't have emerald ash borer that we know about. 
And uh, this, we have found emerald ash borer using the system. We know it works. So it's a way to help us monitor its movement across the state. We also collect lots. The vast majority of insects you'll collect are going to be natives. And that data gets kept, gets cataloged, and gets shared so that we are able to understand the biology of our native insects more closely. Um, not, and not the least of which, you guys become ambassadors. Um, you help increase awareness of these insects and what they can do. You will be uh, talked to when you're walking through a baseball field. You'll have a kid or a parent or somebody come up to you and ask you what you're doing. And it's kind of fun to, to inform them about something they have no idea of. And what happens to the data? Well, I've talked a little bit about it already. We share the data. The insects themselves go into the Purdue Entomological Research Collection at Purdue University. And uh, so they become a permanent scientific record of what we've got in the state and the efforts that our volunteers have put forth. So like I said, if you guys are going to take the time. We're going to make the most out of it. And then this is just a slide about getting involved. You can contact Ann or myself, um, or you can get on the, that um, website there at the back. And uh, just let us know you're interested. I contact everybody personally. So um, hopefully, if you're interested, it'll be a rewarding experience for you. And you'll be really pitching in. That's all I've got. Thank you. Great.